uh, 6.2, which is consideration of update on COVID-19. And uh, we have Dr. Pace with us. Th Dr. Pace, thank you for coming in and giving us uh, an update again on this whole situation. I guess there's some more going on and uh, we'd like to hear about it. And I think the public would as well. So the floor is yours, Dr. Pace. Hey, uh, Mr. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Vice Chair, I, I, did we do public input or did I miss that? I thought I thought he did, uh, but I'll let's see here. Yeah, he did. Oh, he did do public input. Okay. Yeah, and I and, and when it no one no one moved forward, so I went ahead and brought it back to the board and then moved oh, okay. on. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Very no, sorry. No worries. No worries. All right, Doctor Pace, the floor is yours. All right. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Supervisor, for uh, having us this morning. Um, <clears throat> going to try to give a quick update today, talk a little bit about the overview and where we're at with the tier system, the surge, and vaccines. Those are kind of the main topics today, but things are looking a little better than they have been the last several weeks, and uh, Sarah's going to, Sarah, our epidemiologist, is going to give the data about that, so thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, can I share my screen, get permission to share my screen, please? Thank you. So like Dr. Pace said, um, it's it's looking a little better than when I was here two weeks ago presenting to the board. Um, so I have a couple slides to give you an update on what's happening at the state level in the region and in Lake County. Um, so two days ago, over 400,000 tests were reported in the state of California. So you can see this dark blue line, the 14 day average um, remains high, testing remains high in the state. And the good news here is over on the right, this is our 14 day testing positivity has decreased dramatically really since the first of the year. So it's really promising that we see testing is still high, but testing positivity is going down. Um, it's telling us that the the virus is is decreasing throughout the the state. Um, uh, two days ago, twenty seven thousand new cases were reported in California, which is significantly down. You can see from our peak here in December, the month of December. So our fourteen day average, we're finding there. We've talked so much about wanting to see this this curve start to bend downward, and here we see it decreasing with the last seven days or so, ranging between twenty and thirty thousand new cases. So still a significant number of cases, but to see this downward trend pretty consistently is feeling really good in this moment. Um, correspondingly, we've seen we're, we're at the top of the curve trending downward with the number of hospitalized COVID patients. Um, so still significantly more than we had during the summer, but again, moving in the right direction as our case rate declines. Uh, in the same vein, we've seen we're seeing a decrease in COVID ICU hospitalized patients. Um, so we were over 5,000 uh, for a while, and now we've seen that just starting to decline, lagging behind our case numbers. Um, and so we have a little bit more ICU availability in the state than we'd had previously. There's also been some capacity added um, in Rancho in, and in several other regions that's helped us a little bit as well. Um, so ICU capacity in Lake County and Rancho. So in the past seven days in Lake County, um, we've had six to eight of the eight uh, ICU beds occupied um, and 43% to 71% of those have been COVID positive patients. Over the last three days, it's been the lowest we've seen in some time, which is a early but promising sign. Um, and in Rancho, over the last seven days, so this is our Northern California region that the state has assigned us to, um, essentially Lake, or excuse me, Lake Mendocino North. Um, we've seen 16 to 25% COVID positive patients with 86 to 95% of the ICU or 86 to 95 of the ICU beds occupied. And we've added some capacity in the Rancho region, which has led to um, this next slide where two days ago, we reported 48% ICU availability in the region, which is significantly higher. Um, as you may recall, we were floating between sort of 18% and 35% um, in the weeks prior. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the state 
lifted the regional stay home order in the three regions, San Joaquin, Bay Area, and Southern California that were still under it due to four week projections that puts their region's ICU capacity above the 15% threshold. And that was effective um, immediately yesterday. Um, so the, the whole state, uh, Rancho, we've all, um, well, I'll finish, uh, I'll talk about deaths first before I talk about the tier system. Um, so our, the number of deaths are still increasing in California um, due to the lag. Um, 37,000 people have died from COVID. Um, and I think it was a question two weeks ago at this meeting about um, the age of people who have died from COVID in Lake County. So I looked at that and 64% of the COVID deaths were among people 70 years of age or older. 27% were among people 60 to 69 years and 9% were under 60 years. Um, and I'll be um, doing a review of the COVID deaths. And so we'll in the next week or two we'll probably have another update for you then. Um, so here is our epi curve, um, and I, I want to go th through this and point out some things why we're, we're um, in the moment feeling, uh, feeling better than we have in the last couple of weeks. So um, in the last seven days, we've identified about 93 new cases. So if you remember from previous weeks, we were identifying up to like 300 new cases sometimes in the last seven days. So this has dropped. Um, the week of January 10th through the 16th, this purple bar, um, the state, we, because uh, Rancho obviously never under the stay at home order, but now that um, we were always in that tier system that the state was using, now the whole state is back to that tier system. Um, so Lake County, we remain in the purple tier because we had more than 43 cases in this week. Um, so that will be announced later today that Lake County remains in the purple tier, which is an indicator of widespread transmission in the community. The, the, uh, the promising piece of information here is looking at the week we just finished. So this was uh, January 17th through um, Saturday, just a couple days ago. And so far, we've only identified 83 new cases. Now, we'll continue to see this bar increase as, you know, people who got tested on Saturday, for example, get their test results today. So it will increase, but it does look like, we, since we don't have the full seven-day lag, it does look like we're going to see a substantial decrease in this past week. Um, so, uh, I hope that holds, and I hope we are starting to see the bend in our curve locally. Um, and then I just sort of showing you the same data here, wanted to give you a regional perspective. So I'm showing the, the five regions, um, and then you can see they all started to decrease right at the, about the same time, about a week or two ago. And you can see Lake County is here in the purple line here. I know it's hard to see, tried to indicate it here, but you can see that we haven't quite seen that decline because of the seven day lag. But with this last week showing very promising signs of fewer cases, I expect that we'll start to see the decline that the other regions have experienced for the last couple of weeks. Um, and again, today at about noon, the state will announce the tier assignment. And those, these are our metrics um, for the tier assignment, a case rate for that week, about the same as our previous week. And the testing positivity is down slightly about 1% from last week. Um, this is my last slide. I just wanted to highlight recent cases, even though we are seeing it go down, we still are seeing cases throughout the community. I've listed it by supervisorial district on the left. So these are cases that we've opened and identified between January 12th to the assignment, a case rate for that week. Um, so you can see by district on the left. And then I just wanted to highlight something that I saw in this roughly two week period. We did start to see a slight increase in cases among children, zero to 14 years of age, and a slight decrease in cases among those 65 and older. So um, I'll continue to watch that, but that did stand out to me when I was looking at our most recent cases. So we'll be monitoring that. 
um, and we'll inform you at the next opportunity if there's any major changes in any of the demographics. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So um, as you can see, the testing positivity is down. The case rate looks like it's dropping. So we, hopefully we are starting to turn the curve now. Um, very uh, reassuring. And one of the things you can see in there is the um, the ICU availability, the hospital availability in the Bay Area. It looks like it's starting to loosen up a little bit. So that's been a very concerning thing for me and for the local medical providers was that as it gets congested in the Bay Area and Sacramento and as our hospitals are filled, it's harder to move people out and things can back up. We saw over the weekend this past weekend, both hospitals seem to be able to keep moving people through. And so it definitely has the sense that things are starting to improve. Um, that has led the, the governor to make a big announcement yesterday to, re, to lift the regional stay at home orders, like Sarah mentioned. And uh, so the, the whole rest of the state now is going to be back to where we are in Lake County. So it really it does not mean a change in for us in Lake County or in the Northern California region that we're still in the purple tier. Uh, outdoor dining is allowed, indoor dining is not allowed. It's basically the same restrictions we've been in for the last six weeks, but for most of the rest of the state, it's been a, it's a big change. And um, some people feel like it's a little quick and others feel like, well, the, the uh, data is reassuring. So we can see it seems pretty clear from, at least from the lens of the public health people, that these restrictions put into place and it takes three to four weeks before you really start seeing the, uh, the uh, case rate change and the test positivity change. So um, hopefully we're going in the right direction now. I think one of the things we have to be aware of is these variants. You're probably seeing things in the news about the variants. We don't know exactly what they mean or what the significance is right now. There's a couple different variants that are showing up in Lake County and in California. If you watch the news, the, the one over in um, England, B117, looks kind of scary. It seems to increase the transmission, the contagion rate. It may make it more um, dangerous to people that actually get it. But um, we're seeing some of that down in Southern California that hasn't been identified in Northern California yet. There's a couple other variants that have been identified that look kind of similar to that one uh, in the way they work. But we don't really know yet whether they make uh, make it more contagious or impact people harder. So we're just waiting to see. But this is part of the kind of anxiety out there right now is to see what impact this all has on things. So, um, Dr. Pace, may I? Do you mind if I make a note on on that? Um, and so the the ICU to the his point of the variant and it circulate they're circulating in California. And we don't quite know the implication. The state is with the ICU projections. One of the inputs to that is um, the R effective, which does account for how much of the virus is circulating today. So what a lot of epidemiologists are going to be watching very closely is as the variants become increasingly pre uh, prevalent in the state, if they are in fact more infectious or contagious, we'll see that our, we likely will see that our effective go up. And that um, could change, of course, the four-week projection that we'd have reduced ICU capacity if we do see increased rates. So I just wanted to make that note that that's something we're watching very carefully. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, that's sort of some of the technical description, but basically the variant is a little bit of a curveball and we don't know exactly what it's going to mean for us going down the road, And uh, but it's definitely something we're all watching. So uh, it sounds like there's questions about vaccine and I sure am seeing a lot of questions out there. It's a very confusing situation. There's a lot of moving parts. The, the meeting I need to get off here for in a little bit is, is an update from the state. They're changing things all the time. But um, one is, is just to let people know there is information available. I know it's been a little hard and we've had a little you know, it's taken us some time to sort of get things in place, but this is moving really fast. And so now people, if they have some vaccine questions, they can try calling 211.
the information line and there we're updating them and giving them information. So that's one place where you can try to get information. The second thing is, is our website, uh, the Lake County Health Department website has a vaccine information page. And I think uh, Supervisor Sabate yesterday mentioned that it was a little hard to find and I think they've fixed that now. So if that's still a problem, let us know and we'll we'll update that. We're we're trying to get information out there so people can access it. You can also call the Mohawk line, which is where you've been able to get COVID information from the county for um, several months now. And so all these are places to, to start getting information. Also the press releases and, and uh, I think we're gonna start doing a, another weekly um, video feed to keep everybody updated because it is hard to know it's moving quickly and people want to know where and when they can get appointments so the amount coming into the county continues to be the main issue we're getting about 400 a week this week we've gotten 800 so they doubled it this week um we don't know what next week's allocation is so it's all we we're just going week to week trying to set up the appointments and get these things out within the week of when we get them or, you know, soon thereafter. So we're not hanging on to a bunch of vaccine for future use. We, we are needing to kind of think about second doses, but we're, we're basically navigating this on a week by week basis as best we can. Um, the tier system is the way, again, that we're sort of trying to prioritize the people that we would think should get the vaccine first. We really want everybody that wants to get vaccinated to get vaccine to get the vaccine as soon as possible. But with such a limited amount, we're going to have to uh, kind of try to control it and get it to the people, get the people to the front of the line that need to be um, that need to be vaccinated the quickest because of concerns about safety or um, or. Uh, things like that. So it's not first come, first serve. There is no, so just to be clear, there is no way for people to call us and get an appointment for the vaccine. Uh, the medical providers in the community, some of them are offering the vaccine and um, especially Southern Adventists have, have uh, their own supply chains. And so those are ways to get it. And the health department and some of the other medical providers we're start we're trying to give them some vaccine but again the amounts just very limited also Safeway is now starting to uh, offer the vaccine as well we're, we're providing them with it through the through the health department so you can get it through other places around the community but um, for the health department there's not really a way to call and get an appointment what we're doing now is we're prioritizing the people in the t phase 1a which we're the healthcare providers basically. And um, those have been pretty much completed, but not everybody was captured the first time. So we're trying to uh, have some space for those folks to get vaccinated. All three of the nursing homes, the residents in the nursing homes have been vaccinated now. Uh, this, the, the other groups that we're prioritizing right now are teachers and school staff, and they will be contacted by their school district to make appointments. And we're trying to get them through. We're hoping to get that everybody that wants it done by the end of next week, but we'll see how that goes. Again, it depends on supply. And then we're prioritizing the, the elders. Now this is, you know, the guideline says 65 and older, but we're particularly interested in trying to get the most vulnerable, the most fragile folks in that age range. And so we've asked the senior centers to, um, fill the appointments that we have up with the people that they see as the most vulnerable. So again, you don't need to call the senior centers. You don't need to call the health department. They will be contacting the people that they're identified. Now, of course, there's going to be some people that aren't connected with the senior center. They should be contacting their medical provider. If that's not really working, we're going to have to figure out another way once we get through this first week or two to get those other folks in the, in the line. But, um, you know, it's not perfect what we're doing, but we're just trying to make sure that the people that are the most vulnerable get to the front of the line. Um, so we are, so again, there are other options around the community, the other medical providers and uh, things are, are worth trying and, and Sutter and Adventists are both pretty aggressively getting out there and doing um, vaccinations for their patients. It's, it's only for their patients, I believe right now. So, and then the next tier is going to be, once we get this one stabilized a little bit, the next one is going to be uh, food and ag workers. Um, and that's going to be a big group. We're going to have to sort of figure out how to do that. I think we're still a couple weeks away. The uh, um, 
and uh but that's that's where we're working towards next to try to get the vineyard workers the farm workers and other food folks working in the food industry because they're out there in the community they have to keep working and they're at risk and there's been a lot of risk of those folks getting uh contacting them by contacting the virus so um so anyhow that's kind of the general overview today i think uh the over the, the kind of the conclusions are that things are looking better. This is the first time I feel like we've been able to be optimistic now in a couple months. And, you know, I think we're probably coming out of the worst phase of the winter uh, outbreak the, from the holidays. Uh, the variant is a concern and we're going to have to keep watching that because this could kind of change the whole uh, landscape of things, but at least right now, it seems like we're moving forward in a good way. And we are doing everything we can to get the vaccines out there for people and um, getting people vaccinated as quickly as possible. But at the rate we're getting the vaccine in, it's still gonna be months before we get, you know, a, a significant portion of the population done. But at least we're, we're starting to target the most, um, vulnerable folks and and I really appreciate that the community has been cooperative our our vaccination sites have gone well and people have been you know um, not shown up without appointments because don't show up without an appointment please we won't accept you and uh, people have been really kind of trying to work with us to get this out as best we can we've gotten a lot of help from the senior centers and from social services and behavioral health and from the law enforcement in the community and you know uh, the city of clearly there's been a lot of people that are all kind of tossing their hats in to help help the community get this vaccine and it's it's very much appreciated and uh so I think that's it for today. Thank you very much, Dr. Pace. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, I changed yes. my uh, hardware here. Appreciate uh, Sam's help for making that happen. Um, any questions for Dr. Pace or Sarah? Go ahead, Supervisor Paiska. Um, so thank you for the extra data on the age um, of the people that have died that kind of helps paint the picture of what's been going on. Um, I had a chance to volunteer last week at the vaccination clinic and um, it was so wonderful to see so many people coming in. They were so happy, um, you know, coming in with their walkers and their wheelchairs, really fragile people. So um, it it was a, a great day to get that started. And I appreciate all the people that are working so hard to make that happen. I just have a couple questions. Um, do we have data yet on how much of our population has been vaccinated? Well, so through the health department, I think there's something like 2000 people, something like that. And then there's probably another thousand, maybe a little more between the two hospitals and tribal health. Tribal health has another supply chain through Indian Health Service. So I'd say it's probably around 3,000, which is what maybe a little, like probably a little under 5%, I'd say between three and 5% of the population. So, uh, and this is a month, a little more than a month into it. So, you know, at this rate to get to whatever, Dr. Um, Fauci's 80% rate, we got a lot, 20 months or something at this rate. So, you know, it's a long time. Uh, um, yeah. 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 I read this morning that the national average is about 3%. So it sounds like we're tracking on that. And um, hopefully we can um, collect all the data from the different partners so we have a really clear view on, on what our strategy is and how much further it's going to be. Um, so... After we move, after we get the 75 and older vaccinated, and I don't know what the time frame is on that, if it's a couple of weeks, and we move into the food and ag workers, are we also going to be vaccinated the 65 and over with that tier? It, you know, uh, it looks like the state guidelines are in the process of changing. And so they are, um, so probably we will, we are doing 65 and older now. It's just, we're trying to prioritize the fragile ones. So, um, and uh, yeah, I'm not exactly, I think, you know, I'm hedging a little bit because a lot depends on how much vaccine we get. 
if we're only getting 400 a week, then I'm probably going to be real stingy about it. If we're getting starting to get thousands a week, then we'll just start getting it out there. So that's really what's uh, determining it now is how we're going to do this. Okay. Um, so with the new variants um, that we don't know a lot about, can you talk about the effectiveness of the different types of masks and um, if we should be all using N95s now, if possible? Well, um, N95 is the most effective. So if you're going to be in a place, I mean, the best thing to do is to avoid being out in public as much as possible with people that aren't in your household. That's really kind of the goal here. And even though the state has kind of loosened that up, it hasn't really changed the situation that's going on. So especially if you're somebody who feels like you really should get a vaccine, you're 65 and older, but doing pretty well and, and kind of far back in the line, I would really encourage you to avoid a lot of contact where, where there could be risk because it's, it's out in the community, you're going to bump into it. Um, if you wear an N95, you're much more protected than if you wear a surgical mask. If you wear a surgical mask, you're much more protected than if you don't wear anything. The, uh, the CDC, it looks like they're starting to come out with some recommendations now about double masking. So wearing two mask, two surgical masks, um, that there's some increased protection with that. So, you know, I think we're going to see some sort of strategies to try to impact this, uh, you know, their... I think the preferred, the, the most effective is to stay home until the until the rate goes down in the community. Once the rate goes down to under 25 or so, we're, then we're talking a kind of a different scenario. But as high as the transmission rate is now, um, if when you go to when you go to the store, you'll probably be in the aisle with some people that have it. And uh, but if you wait, you know, I mean, or go when it's really really quiet, and then wait until March or April to do more of these activities, you'll probably be safer. But yeah, if you wanted to be as safe as possible, like my daughter had to fly recently to go do something that was essential. And uh, I had her wear uh, N95 while she was flying. Well, I was just wondering if, um, if we should be providing N95s to the staff that have to be at the courthouse or in any way where they're interacting with the public or, um, you know, around a lot of people throughout the day. Um, yeah, I mean, that's something we can talk about. Okay. Um, I have one more question. <laughs> or It's not a question, but you and I talked or um, exchanged emails earlier on in the week. Um, you know, we're facing a possible significant drought with dangerous fire conditions this summer if things don't significantly change and they may or may not this week. Um, so a lot of people are, are working on um, getting out and doing maintenance on their land or community work days where, um, you know, the vegetation needs to be managed. And I know the Cobbery Council is sponsoring a few of those work days. And if anybody around the community in the whole county wants to um, join up with their neighbors to do this work. This work is considered essential, but you do need to wear a mask and not share tools. Uh, but I just wanted to um, bring that up as a point that we had talked about that earlier. And if there's anything else you wanted to add. Well, yeah, I know. I, I think that's a great point. I'm glad you're bringing that up because right. We're, you know, fire season is just right around the corner. It seems like we just got out of it and it's not looking good for the way it's going to go this year. So I think absolutely to take precautions against that and prepare, prepare for what's coming in a few months is, is important. And being outside is way safer than being inside. So doing outdoor activity with some, you know, specific precautions is probably pretty darn safe. And so absolutely, I would say if any protection, protective work people can do out there is important right now. It's This could be a bad year the way it looks right now. So I, I want to interrupt real quick. Dr. Pace, I believe you had an important meeting to get to uh, at 930. 
Uh, are you okay with continuing? Do you need to jump off to get to that meeting? I don't want to uh, stop you from having the conversations you need to have to help us with what we're dealing with in the county uh, when it comes to COVID. So I, I'm, I'm leaving that up to you because we could pause and continue this item at a later time uh, just to make sure you don't miss those types of meetings. Well, thanks. It probably makes sense to go ahead and complete it now. You know, unfortunately, the state's doing these meetings right when most counties have their board of supervisors meetings. I'm not sure why they do it that way, but we'll catch up. This is, you know, it's important to answer your all's questions and to talk to the public. So I appreciate it. Thank you for the consideration, though. I just wanted to check in. So let's go ahead and uh, open it up for the rest of the board members. Any other questions as well? Supervisor Scott? I just have one simple question and just thank you, Dr. Pace, again for, for all the work with you and your team. So when our community dials 211, who are they actually calling? I think what's happening, I think this is a state run um, uh, line that has, but then they have specific information for each county. So people would get, you know, information that we've fed them back to the back to them so uh and you're not going to necessarily get all your questions answered but at least some of the basic and then as we update it we can keep feeding that so um if you want to get a specific question answered the best way to do that is through the mohawk line um and uh that's how we're doing that thank you any other questions or comments supervisor crandall Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Pace. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, I know that I, I like what we covered already. I just wanted to emphasize because I've had some questions and I and I asked you yesterday, but I just want to get it out in the meeting format um, that we are on the, we regress back to the situation where we're in the purple tier and all that stuff uh, that was previous to the state mandated lockdown. And so it still takes us to go from where we're at, the purple tier, down to either the orange or any other. And that that just still based on the same same concept that was uh, previously dated before this uh, mandatory lockdown, and I just wanted to make sure that people heard that. Um, even though you and I had discussed that, and I know the answer, I just wanted to make sure that you can emphasize on that. Right, and um, yeah, it's really important. So Lake County has been in the purple tier now since I think it was back in November, and. Um, we we did not go into this thing that the governor just put in. He's called it the regional stay at home order that he just took off yesterday. So we're really unchanged. One thing that's that I'm glad you reminded me was when Sarah had those graphs up there, you know, when there was one graph with that epi curve she shows and it shows the weekly numbers and there's a line along the bottom. That line along the bottom is at 42 cases. We have to drop below that line before we can go to the red tier, which is the next one. And we're, so that's 42 cases in a week. And we're at something like over 200 right now. So we have to drop like 80% before we're gonna be ready to do it. So hopefully, you know, that, that could be by the end of February if we're lucky. Um, so, you know, it's not, if things start dropping, they can really drop. It's just, it sort of depends on how careful people are, I think, really, and, and what happens with this variant. Thank you for that. Yeah, I just, um, yeah, and, and you've covered a lot of the vaccine questions that they think that, that came forward. I just know that there's a lot of folks that are eager to take it, um, and um, they, they will just call their, and I, I didn't hear you correctly, local senior centers, or do they call the Mohawk? Well, again, People don't need to call anybody right now because there are no publicly available appointments. We, okay. through the health department vaccines, we're contacting people that uh, either through the, the school districts, they're contacting their people or the senior centers or some, some of the county folks that are helping them are contacting the vulnerable seniors. Um, if people want to try to see if they can get it as soon as possible, the best thing to do is to check with your medical provider. But most of them are, you know, most of them are reaching out to the people that they think are should be at the front of the line too. But some people are able to get in the line that way. Uh, the main thing, I'm just trying to 
encourage is for folks to be patient. We just don't have enough to go around. We're trying to target the most vulnerable people. If, But for example, if your mom is really, really vulnerable and uh, she hasn't gotten a call yet, it's probably worth it to call her doc and see if they're able to do it, especially if they're involved with Sutter or um, Adventist. They have the most vaccine right now, but um, that's one way to try to access it. But again, it's really, if you're a healthy 67 year old, I would encourage you to just be patient a little bit and let these frailer folks get it first if you can. And so, and let us kind of work our way through the priority list. So don't, please don't call the senior centers. They're getting completely overwhelmed. And um, I just wanted that to be emphasized. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for giving me the chance. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Simon. Uh, yeah, Dr. Pace, uh, you know, thank you guys for everything that you're doing, all, you know, all partners that are helping the public health department and everything. And uh, it's so challenging right now, like you said, with the supply uh, that we're getting on the vaccines. Uh, what I would like to get out there, and I, I know that we are right now, are the thing hindering us is the amount of vaccine that we're getting into the county uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, if that number changes, as you spoke about earlier, uh, going from 400 to a couple of thousand or more, I, I just want to get it out to the public, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but are we prepared if our numbers increase to get as many shots in the arms as possible? Are we prepared for that if there is a shift change, uh, or are you guys working on a plan to be prepared uh, if we get more vaccine to get those into the arms of our constituents? Right. Thank you for that. Um, we have a plan in place. We have the, the site set up. We are kind of working as hard as we can behind the scenes to get the staffing set up. That's really a big part of what our, we're having trouble with. We have, you know, basically enough staff to do what we're at right now, but to go up to, you know, four times as much in a week is going to be uh, a, a kind of a massive uh human resource undertaking and we're we're working on that we're trying to get volunteers set up we're trying to get um uh we're asking the state for resources they've got a pathway they say they're going to be providing help but none of us come each week you know it's the same thing we are asking the county uh, employ you know the the county system to funnel some people our way to help with this because you, you know, I think your point of this is this is a big undertaking and we only have a handful of people working on it. And so the county and the other partners in the community, the cities and everybody else, it's going to be all of us working together to get this thing happening in the way that it is going to be able to keep people safe in a quick fashion. And so we're really trying to set the framework so that when we, we start getting this getting the awareness we're going to get more that we can actually bring people in and coordinate them but it's you know it's a challenge along with everything else and everybody's working full time and doing their thing so it's to to pull them off to do this is not easy and it's it's different from a fire you know like lake county's so good about responding to fires those rapid emergencies that come out of the blue and um but they only last you know a week or two and then everybody can kind of get back to their normal life and here we are 10 months into this plus it's been a year really since the virus was first detected and uh and this response is going to take probably months uh in terms of getting the vaccine out so getting the personnel is going to be the biggest challenge and getting the supervisory staff and kind of the the strategic thinking planning staff is what we're we're really we're hard at work every day right now that's what we're working on okay Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Pace, I appreciate that we're getting more vaccines um, because at the rate that we were going, it was gonna take just way too long to be able to get to the majority of our populations. Uh, there is some potential changes. There's nothing specific that I can state as to what the uh, state vaccine plan will change to, uh, but they are looking to change it as of, I believe, uh, phase two it is. Uh, phase 1B uh, to start really looking at the um, 
age groups versus a anything else, but they don't have anything in uh, in concrete yet. It's not been decided on, but that is what the conversation is leading towards. Uh, the majority of counties are still in phase 1A. We're one of the few counties in the state that has started 1B. Uh, I was just talking to uh, one of my siblings over in Santa Clara County, and they're still on phase 1A. They're, they haven't started their uh, educators, and I know we started that last week. Uh, so while we all want to do more, uh, we do need to recognize that where we stand in the grand scheme of things is, is we're right in the mix and we're, we're kind of a, a ahead of some of the pack as well. Uh, it does create difficulties if we get more, but I think that uh, we will be ready. I just actually sent an email to Legislative Affairs over at the state of California asking what, what needs to be unblocked in order for us to get the state staffing. If we were able to get state staffing for the Verily site, uh, should be the exact same scenario for us to get staffing for our vaccination sites, especially since that is uh, our number one priority when it comes to COVID-19 is to try and deploy the vaccine as efficiently as possible. Uh, hopefully we'll see more change too coming from the federal government as far as the number of vaccines that they're able to submit to the state. Uh, and then uh, eventually get into our hands. Uh, I also did make a request, this was talked about, I think either last week or maybe a couple weeks ago, uh, just forgot to uh, mention it. Um, at, we're not the only county that's asking how many total vaccinations has been done in this county. Um, between hospitals, clinics, Safeway and everyone else, they do have to enter the information in a state database Therefore, the state should know which, uh, what percentage of your residents have been vaccinated, uh, but that information is not available as of yet. And I know that we struggle to even know how many tests were being done in our county. We're, we're, we're gonna deal with the same exact thing with the vaccine. So we really need the state to step up and provide that level of information. And again, we're not the only county making that request. Um, and I think that they're going to end up uh, offering that kind of information, I think even publicly rather than just directly to the public health agencies uh, so that we can all make sure that we're up to date on what's happening. Um, and I do want to reemphasize something that was already said. Uh, please do not call your senior centers. Uh, you definitely can call your primary provide, uh, doctors, your primary physicians uh, to see if they have the potential to provide a vaccine for you. Uh, but the senior centers will be reaching out to you uh, for the fact that they have uh, seniors on specific programs, which puts them in the very vulnerable list, such as those that are on Meals on Wheels. Uh, so please, uh, it, it's, it's a patient game. Uh, it's a game of patience uh, where we all want to be at the front of the line, um, but we, we, we have to be fair and equitable in the way that it's being deployed. Um, and I know that we're, we're trying our best, even though we may have some subtle differences in how we feel that it should be deployed. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Uh, yes, last week I brought up Lake County residents only. Uh, I still wanna bring that up for the fact of in the future, when we really start expanding it to a much larger audience, especially if the state makes the change to be based on age, uh, it's just something I want you to keep in the back of your mind. Of course, I, I'm, I'm only one person saying this. It's not coming from the board. Uh, but I think it's important uh, that if we're being allocated doses based on our needs as a county, uh, that we make sure that people are not lining up from other counties where they're being pushed out because they don't have access. I know that this is happening. Uh, just read some articles this morning that in LA that uh, film uh, uh, executives are offering to pay $10,000 to get a vaccine right now from a doctor, uh, yet they don't meet any of the criteria. Uh, we have Canadians that are flying down to Florida because it's uh, no man's land in Florida and everybody can go and get a, a anyone can go get a vaccine. And so there, it's literally becoming a tourist thing for people to go find where it is that they can go get a vaccine. And I just want to make sure that uh, with our medically fragile population that we have, that we make sure that we take care of our population before we uh, uh, have it uh, handed out to somewhere else. And, and I think there's some simple ways to check that um, and, and hopefully we can make that happen. Right now, that is not the case since we are uh, calling people to make appointments, not them calling us to make appointments. So I uh, just wanted to bring that back up. Other than that, uh, that's all that I have. Um, Jake, let's go ahead and any other comments from the board members before we open it up to the public? 
you, you know, obviously, um, Supervisor Sabatia, I know you brought up about our Lake County residents. I know we went through this early on with the testing uh, where we had questions. So obviously I would be in support doing the best that we can to take care of Lake County first, you know, uh, taking care of our elders and in and, and all of our population, uh, you know, ultimately understand the challenge. That's more work for folks that we've been having work for 10 months on this. And I know we'll be adding uh, some more, but um, yeah, I would definitely be in favor of doing the best that we can to keep it to Lake County residents. Appreciate that. Thank you. Jake, let's go ahead and open up the Zoom room and see if we have any public comments. All right. I've sent a mute request out to the Zoom room floor. If you would like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. Hi, my name's Joni. My name is. Here, let's go ahead and start with Joni, and we'll get to phone 6205 after Joni. Hi, um, my name is Joni, and I have a, a question about the phases of the vaccine for Dr. Pace. And Joni, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you real quick just for public record. Can we get your full name? Joni Alford. Thank you. Um, on the phases, I, I realized that right now we're doing the 1A and B, but in C, you have the um, 50 to 64 year olds all in one. What about the ones that are vulnerable, the ones that really need to be at the head of the line, like up with the older people? Right. Um, well, that's a state um, kind of template that's out now. I think it's going to change. Um, I think they're in the process of changing it. So by the time we get to that phase, it's probably going to be different. And I'm hoping by that point, we're going to have a lot more vaccine available. And so, you know, I think what's going to happen by that point is that it's going to be like other vaccines that you, if usually people that are vulnerable or have medical conditions, they have a medical provider and that those providers would help the most vulnerable people get vaccinated first. You know, they'll call you up and they'll say, Joni, you need to get in and get your vaccine because I'm worried about you and I don't want you to get COVID. And then they'll help you do that. I, I That's probably what's going to be happening. If we stay at this really small number for a long time, then we're going to have to figure out how to do that. But I would agree. I would I definitely want the vulnerable people vaccinated first because those are the folks that get, are the highest risk of bad things happening if they get the COVID. Okay, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joni. Thank you, Dr. Pace, for the response. Uh, we have phone 6205. If, if you're still here for public comment, if you can give us your full name, please. Yes, this is Bart Levinson. Good morning. Um, Dr. Pace, if I heard you correctly, you said you already asked uh, the county for personnel uh, that you'll need for uh, adequate vaccination rollout. I was wondering if you could say how many people it is that you are needing. Well, um, right now we need, you know, right, what we're trying to do is to set up a six day a week stand up site and then if we get a lot of vaccine to set up some big mass vaccination sites sort of like the uh, heroes of health and safety that people may be familiar with that has been coordinated with Sutter in the past and um, so it really I mean it really depends on how much vaccine we get if we're getting this much we, we need a few we need a couple handfuls of people to help just staff all these different sites and to help with the appointments and to help with traffic and all that if we start getting a thousand a, a week we're gonna have to double that and so then we're talking dozens of people if we're getting five thousand a week which would be great because at five thousand a week you know that's gonna take that's still gonna take you know three four months to get the 80% the people done, but we're going to need a lot of people then. And we're going to need people who are good at organizing events and people who are good at kind of coordinating people as well as just the worker bees. We just don't have those people in the health department. And if we are pulling from the county, then other essential functions are not going to be done. So, you know, it's, and we don't know. That's what I'm wondering is, is what is realistic 
uh, if we could hear from the supervisors about how this is being realistically uh, addressed and planned for now um, or outreach uh, being done to fill in where there will be gaps. And I know that uh, whenever we get onto our EOC calls, uh, we have a uh, lady working over in public health who has been in charge of preparing uh, volunteers throughout this entire time. Uh, I know that she's been uh, helpful in making uh, sure that we staffed our testing sites. Uh, I believe she still has a list of, of folks as well. And so hopefully that will help, but I'm sure that that is a, uh, um, it's an unknown as to what's needed based on the fact that it's unknown and how many vaccines we will be receiving in the future. Um, but I hope, I'm sure that if we get a much larger amount than anticipated that we uh, will work towards making sure that we meet the needs of the community to get those vaccines out as soon as possible. I know that I've already shared my uh, uh, my offer to Dr. Pace that I will do whatever is needed to be done to make sure that we have everyone uh, and I will volunteer myself as well, uh, that we have what we need to make sure those vaccines are deployed efficiently. Thank you. What I'm wanting to hear is the plan on the part of the county um, uh, and the Board of Supervisors to uh, be actively planning, creating the plan for this and keeping the public posted both of what um, uh, labor you have ready to go and what number of volunteers are currently needed. And I know that Dr. Pace has been working on uh, that type of plan, maybe not specifically to the maximum amount that is possible. Uh, but we are in support of what Dr. Pace is working on and trying to provide him the resources he needs to be able to meet the needs of any vaccination clinics. So uh, and, that, that's what I'm asking is from the Board of Supervisors, how many people are you prepared to provide? So that it isn't just on Dr. Pace that uh, the information is coming from the county and the Board of Supervisors, uh, what will be there to help Dr. Pace. And it's a countywide effort as far as who those volunteers are. And I'll, I'll go ahead and ask Ms. Hutchinson, who's raising her hand, uh, who seems to want to comment on this. Yeah, it's uh, to basically echo what you said, um, Mr. Chair, it's a work in progress. We recognize the need. Uh, we're working very closely with Dr. Pace to prepare for putting those resources in place, but we do not have specific answers to questions about the number of volunteers uh, for the reasons he's detailed, because the um, flow of vaccines to Lake County is, um, has, you know, has not been consistent yet, and we're looking forward to the day when it will be. In the interim, anyone can sign up to be a volunteer employee through our Human Resources Department. Uh, I know that they actively um, take applications for that. And so if someone is interested in serving personally, I would encourage them to do that now. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Hutchinson, but I believe at one point in time in uh, the search for volunteers to help with whatever uh, the need was at the time that HR has gotten involved uh, with helping to uh, move certain staff who uh, may be uh, non-essential during these times and maybe uh, moved over to the needs of public health. Yes, that's true. So HR is uh, very actively involved and is also working with departments to secure disaster service workers, meaning uh, existing county employees that can be temporarily assigned to support the disaster effort. Can Red Cross assist in any way? I believe Red Cross is on our calls in our EOCs and are definitely uh, involved in any way that they can be involved depending on uh, the needs. And Dr. Pace would be able to uh, respond better. Can I ask? Well, what I'm hoping I, is that and, the and, 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 county will be and, helping I'm more. Gonna, I'm gonna interrupt. Uh, we do have a time limit on, on public comments. I would say please submit your questions to us. 
uh, as, as we're doing a lot of back and forth on the single public comment right now, uh, I'll let uh, yes. Supervisor Pais yes. finish up and if Dr. Pace has a comment to make, but I would say reach out to your supervisor uh, and make sure to ask those questions if you feel you didn't get a response as I don't wanna ignore your, your comments or your questions, they are good questions, uh, but just know that we are working on it and we are trying our best. Supervisor Pais. Yeah, thank you for your question, Bart. I just wanted to um, uh, kind of reiterate what's been said. The um, HR and um, so the, you can volunteer and get your paperwork in order to do that, just as I did last week on our EOC calls. Um, the Red Cross is involved and also um, they're reaching out to the CERT teams that have been trained. Those are um, the emergency uh, volunteers that are around the county so that they are going to be activated as soon as we need them. So there is a lot of, there's a big effort going on to get people ready to go for when um, we need them. I think that's what your question about, Bart, and I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, Jake, if we can please look and see if there's any other public comment out there. And yes, I have sent another unmute request out to the Zoom room floor. If you'd like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. Okay, and hearing none, let's go ahead and bring it back to the board. Any further comments or questions for Dr. Pace? I, I do have a question. Dr. Pace, you mentioned 80% multiple times. Um, and you mentioned that that was a kind of a, a, a guideline that Dr. Fauci may have provided to say that that's our goal to try and reach 80% uh, vaccination. Um, in the next upcoming meetings, would it be possible for you to let us know uh, what our healthcare professional uh, vaccination rate is and what our educational professional, uh, just to kind of get an idea of where we stand compared to that 80? Try. Uh, yeah, I can try. Um, or, or, or if it's easier to give us an aggregate number to see how far we are along, that would be useful too. Well, I yeah. think we're about 5%, something like that. And then depending on how, you know, we've gotten, say, 3,000 cases, so another 5% probably of people that have been infected. So, you know, we're probably somewhere around 10% kind of thing. Uh, so we're, we've got a long way to go. And the reason I ask is because 80% is a number that doesn't necessarily consider those who don't want to be vaccinated uh, versus those that do. And I just kind of want to get an idea of where do we stand when it comes to our professionals so far um, that have gone through uh, the possibility of being vaccinated. Well, so the herd immunity only works if people are vaccinated. So if 40% of the population declines vaccination, we're not, we'll never get there. It doesn't, the, the virus doesn't care whether you haven't gotten vaccinated because you didn't get it offered or if you just did it because you didn't decline. Um, and from what I'm understanding, a, a rough sketch of the different healthcare facilities, there's something like 60 to 80% of the people are getting vaccinated. It depends on where they are. The doctors and nurses tend to be getting more. The other folks, the other support staff less so. So it seems to be the folks that are closest to the people that are sickest, they know what it looks like. And so they tend to be getting it. Um, also, what we're seeing is that maybe the first time that people are like, well, I don't wanna be the first in line, so maybe I'll wait a couple of weeks. And then once they see that everybody's doing okay with it, then they choose to go ahead and get it. The problem is, is that as we're moving with these phases and we don't have that much vaccine, we kind of move on. We will try to incorporate them in afterwards, but it can, it doesn't, it's not as efficient. Your best chance is to get it when it's first offered. So I think we're in the kind of 70, 80% range with the healthcare providers. The, the teachers were still, you know, we're still waiting to see they're just getting there. But, um, uh, you know, we're kind of in that range, but if a large swaths of the population choose not to get it, we will never get to herd immunity. And then it will continue to be something that pops up regularly in our lives and puts people at risk and things like that. So, you know, uh, that's kind of the quick 
overview anyhow i'm not sure it's it, it's going to be a little hard to get that data because it's such a moving target and it's coming from a lot of different pieces but that's the general impression okay appreciate the comment um any further comments or questions from the board all right dr pace thank you so much for uh, adding some extra time uh to help us uh, get some better understanding and answering some questions uh appreciate your time thank you very much thank you thank you